So I'm Rob Mungovern. I'm here speaking this morning on behalf of Ruth Forksley from the Cambridgeshire Wildlife Trust. Um, I start off with a slide saying this is what we can make our chalk rivers look like if we've got reasonable water flow. This is a section of the Hopper Brook which rises beyond Newton, Triplow Way, flows through the parish boundary of Newton and Foxton and discharges into the River Ree. It was once a nice little chalk stream. It's the river that I actually grew up knowing. Um, but it's suffering <coughs> awfully these days. It's only really worth undertaking habitat enhancements in its lower reaches. It's only its lower reaches where it's got some guaranteed flow. <coughs> I just want to touch upon this bit so we can all agree on some certain facts. The most important point about this slide is the fact that groundwater on a chalk river and a chalk river is a river that receives 95% of its base flow from the ground. And the groundwater supports the river flow. Without that groundwater, chalk rivers sink back into the chalk strata. That's why it's very hard at this point in time to keep our chalk rivers flowing downhill. If you think of the chalk as a sponge, you can only pour water over that sponge if it's wet in itself. If that sponge starts to dry out, that water will sink and dip below the surface. That is, to some extent, a natural occurrence on some chalk rivers. We have the Mizbor in Buckinghamshire, the missing board. That river does go up and down through its geology. That's not the normal process here in South Cambridgeshire. Our chalk rivers used to flow with consistency of flow in decades gone by. What should a chalk river look like? This is a fantastic shot of a chalk river from those lucky counties, Hampshire. It's not from Cambridgeshire, this one. Our chalk rivers aren't as big and mighty as that, but they are still ecologically important. That picture of the Hopper Brook started off looking a little bit like this. But what really makes a chalk stream? It's that crystal clear water, it's that filtered water, it's that water that's ready to be supplied to customers by water companies. It's that stable flow. Our chalk rivers are not prone to rapid floods. They have stability of flows, which made them so good for putting water mills on, which made them so good for irrigating our fields, which also means they have regular and stable temperatures. The water comes out of the ground at a steady temperature between 10 and 12 degrees. So that stability of environments, which makes them very good growing areas for plants. They're very rich in nutrients. So you've got that stability of habitats, which means there's all different ecological niches, from the slight <coughs> silty margins up to the wet, boggy areas that then lead out into fen meadows, if you have the space within the floodplain for that river to function properly. They shouldn't have steep margins. They shouldn't be embanked like the river is through Cambridge. Okay, we know that's important, it's history. There's quite a few factors that are wrong in our small little chalk streams here in South Cambridgeshire and in the city. And if you look very carefully, there's a wonderful brown trout there, sitting, waiting to take what invertebrates might be drifting down in that crystal clear river. But where are our chalk rivers? They're stretching all the way from Hampshire, through Buckinghamshire, up into Hertfordshire, Suffolk touches upon, Cambridgeshire, and then into Norfolk. It's that chalk belt that's spreading across from southwest to east. And if we expand upon our rivers in the Cam catchment, eagle-eyed, we'll see there's three green lines there. The longest one is meant to be about nine kilometres long. That's the Wendon River. But it's dry most of the time. It flows eastwards off of the hills around Chisel. There's a pumping station on that watercourse. It's dry. There's also the little green dot being the Hoffer Brook. I've already said that one dries up in its upper reaches. The next green line is the River Shep. That's a river that I've been managing for over 20 years, and I've learned a hell of a lot about river flows from that stream. But those rivers are only green, they're only given good ecological status because they don't have sewage discharges put, in, put into them. So they are low or acceptable in phosphate levels. All of our other watercourses around this area are suffering from nutrient enrichment. And as Stephen touched upon, we believe that's also partly because we don't have as much water in those rivers to dilute those pollutants anymore. So we've got a lot of watercourses suffering, and we believe that with 
normal water flows, those acceptable water flows, they would be much healthier. So our chalk rivers, we've already said the Cam. The Cam for us is rising beyond Saffron Walden. It's coming down here, flowing northwards. We have its main tributary, 29 kilometres long, the River Grant is meant to be, but yet it was dry at Stapleford. We have the River Ree rising at Ashwell Springs into Hertfordshire, just off here. And then we have the Shep, a good ecological status river. We have the Hoffer Brook, good ecological status. We have the River Mel, where the River Mel Restoration Group are doing great work. We have the Mill River, also focused on habitat enhancement, but suffering awfully from low flows and nutrient enrichment. We have the Wellhead Springs of Bassingball, dry this year. We have the Nine Wells, the ancient water supply of the city of Cambridge, dry this year. The Nine Wells supplied water into Hobson's Conduit. Not a bad little river, but very, very artificial. But luckily, Hobson's Conduit overflows into the Vickers Brook. The Vickers Brook is a good little stream underneath those tree coverings. It's still got its gravel bed. It's got a lot of potential for habitat enhancement and restoration. We then have the Cherry Hinton Brook, suffering awfully from low flows this year. The Cherry Hinton Brook feeds into the Coldens Common, and the Coldens Brook, another stream with a lot of habitat potential for restoration, just upstream of its confluence with the River Cam. We then have the Wilbrum River system, emerging from the Wilbrum Fen area, the Fallbourne Fen, uh, Fallbourne Fen area too. What's important about the Wilbur River system is it supplies water to quiet water. Quiet water is where there's a National Trust water mill. Imagine how awful that would look if that went bone dry. That wouldn't be such a good tourist attraction. We have the loads, those artificial channels said to be cut by the Romans for navigation. We have the new river at Etney. And we have the river Snail, which is actually quite a nice chalk stream as well. That's replicating that geological spread of the chalk coming on up, going up into Norfolk. So why are our chalk rivers special? They are our unique habitat here in the England, in British Isle, in, in England rather. We've got the world's proportion of them. So how can we stand and tell people in developing countries how they should be managing their unique habitats when we're letting ours suffer right in front of our very eyes, when we know what we believe the cause of those degradation habitats are over abstraction? And we've talked about them having stable flows, stability of habitats, enables huge diversity of flora and fauna to exist in these watercourses. This is a plant that's typical of chalk rivers, water crowfoot, ranunculus. It's important because it bulks up the habitats, it bulks up the water column, provides habitat for a huge array of invertebrates, and it also has very attractive white flowers. It's typical of our chalk rivers. It's typical of that English landscape, the Constable paintings kind of pictures. We also have water starwort, which forms these lovely cushions of plants. We have lesser water parsnip. There's a bit of burr reed up there. There's probably water mint there, brookline. Um, if you notice carefully, there's a brown trout there hiding behind that plant of water, cro uh, water starwort. And if you couldn't see that small brown trout, here's a really big one. Caught <laughs> from the River Ree. The potential of our rivers is not to be underestimated. You know, maybe that trout's become big, but it's become predatory eating our fastest declining mammal, the water vole. We still have good populations of water voles here in the south of Cambridge. And this is something we should cherish. It's an it's a endemic part of our river systems. Again, they need stability of flows. They don't want to get flooded out every time the rain comes. We also have interesting species that most people never ever see. This is a freshwater sponge, which is taken on the dendritic form. It's not the kind of blob of sponge you might find under a stone. I found these on the bridge footings at Hawkston by the mill there when there's been good flow years. It regularly pops up on the bridge in the River Shep. But without good water quality, freshwater sponges, the things that are filtering our waters, will fade away. They'll be lost without anybody ever knowing they were there. We have a fantastic mayfly hatch now on the River Ree in the Barrington to Harston Way. Millions of mayflies up in the trees. That's indicative of improving water quality. Less, water, less river dredging, better river management, really. But that river management can only be sustained if we have good river flows. I've talked about chalk springs being that iconic uh, view of an English landscape. Constable's painting such scenes. Byron has written about his endeavours at the Byron's Pool. Chalk rivers have helped us. We've taken from them. 
We'd use them for mills, Bullbeck Mill at Barrington. There were a huge number of mills on the River Ree, indicative of its stable and constant flow. There were mills at Moulton, at Harston. There were three mills on the River Shep, which is only two and a half kilometres long. There were no mills except Poft Mill on the River Bourne, because it's a plain river, flashy in its catchment. So the number of mills was indicative of how important our chalk rivers were and how much energy that flow gave those communities there. I think the people would be boggled to find out that the rivers of Ailey Bain kept flowing due to water being pumped in at another end. So this is some fact. This was the flow from the Iran Aces gauging station centre on the River Granta at the end and very start of October. Gaps gaps in it because its flow was missing. It had dried up. Its flow was intermittent, possibly because of the discharge of some sewage works. But those, you know, I think we'll remember, we've actually had a reasonably wet October. I think I've heard we've had all, if not more, of our annual long-term supply for October. So you might think we'd have a bit more flow on our rivers. No. 6th of October, it's still more or less on its bones. A little bit of a rise as a pulse of water came down the channel due to probably a, a deluge of rain. And then right to data I collected yesterday or Sunday evening, it's still on its bones. We've had a wet October, but yet the River Grant at its bottom end has not started to flow naturally yet. There's not much more that I think we can take from that catchment without the river being gone. And I don't think that's something that we should be accepting, that a river a main tributary of the Cam, 29 kilometres long, one of our healthiest chalk rivers, our larger ones, is almost bone dry. That's some well at end. The second presentation leads on to the second half of Council of Fall Borough. So that's the part I'm standing in for Rupert Bond. We've got them together so we can. Do you want to Do you want me just to continue? Yeah. Okay. Say, so, my talk's in two halves, this is the bit I was really going to get involved in. Um, I start off with a jolly picture. The point being is that our communities, our residents, like to take care of our environment. This is a, a community planting event we held on the River Shep. Look at the range of people we've got out. We've got youngsters to middle-aged bods like me to older people. People want to get involved in practical conservation work. Getting involved in river work, which is what the Wild Trout Trust does, is a really effective way to get people involved in their communities. We can take this kind of work forward. We love working with people. But we can't work with people if we haven't got any flow in our rivers. We can't restore them when the fundamental element that rivers need is gone. This, this wasn't news. This, we saw this coming. At the start of the year, we knew we already had exceptionally low flows on the River Cam in March and April of this year yet very little was said about it. The long-term average flow. There's almost two-thirds of the River Cam's flow missing. And this is in September, when the rivers, chalk rivers, would be at their lowest. So how much of what little flow the Cam should have is missing? That means that the Cam was just not much more than a dribble in its middle reaches. Very, very disappointed for those that know the Cam in better flow years. And the fact that wasn't talked about 25% down at the Elios, and that's taking flow all the way from the Great Ooze, but yet there's a huge amount missing here. Is that because the Little Ooze was only flowing at 31%, and I think the Lark there was 35 or 40%? It's these rivers on the chalk belt oh, have got such a big proportion missing of their flow that the Elios, 25% of long-term average. So we know. Does that come up in your screen? <laughs> Let's press on and see if it disappears. No. You might need to press this game. Click the cross at the top right hand corner. Yeah, I see it. Unless somebody's knocked yeah. the flash on. Hold on. I've got to see where this is. that. Here we go. We know that we've got climate change, and we know it's going to give us problems. But we need to make sure that our rivers and watercourses are resilient. We need to make sure they've got more in the aquifer to buffer these periods. This is 
the environment agency's river augmentation output at Falmy Nature Reserve, RSPB Falmy. This is what's keeping most of our chalk rivers flowing, this important network of pumped water. I'm choosing my words carefully here because I am very, very grateful for this network of supply. I've been um, suffering from river anxiety for about 20 years now since so I've got involved with the River Shep. And I've known that it's a matter of a pump that's keeping our rivers flowing. I'm the guy who used to pop up to Family Nature Reserve every time there had been a thunderstorm to check the water, the, the pump switch hadn't tripped out in a power cut. That's how important it'd be for me. But what I think the general public is not aware of is that our rivers from Hitching right up to Thetford on the Little Ooze area are being supported by this pumped network. It makes them incredibly vulnerable to a power cut. If we had a power cut like that uh, electrical storm that happened in August, if it affected the environment supply to these rivers, we could lose them all overnight. They're very, very vulnerable. We don't have much resilience built into the system. But, thank goodness, thank goodness that network of supply pumps does exist. Otherwise, we would have lost these rivers decades ago. We would have lost these rivers before we started to realize how special they are. And we wouldn't be here talking about what we can do to them. We would have been talking about what they once were. The rivers that flow from Buckingham Way, uh, Buckingham, Buckinghamshire, the Misbourne, the Ver, the Bullbourne, the Gade, they've gone. They've been drying up because they don't have these support systems. So at least we've got this. But it is masking the real situation. It's hiding the vulnerability of these watercourses to the general public. And it costs a lot of money to run these. It's not sustainable. Stephen's already said that 20% of the water that comes out of the ground is then used to put back into this system. It's necessary, but is it what we really should have? Um, as we have more development, we have these uh, convenient schemes. I was a believer in them once. Sustainable urban drainage systems. Sustainable urban drainage systems on new developments often involve in putting water into tanks underground, out of sight, out of mind, and then it flows out of that development site at what's called a greenfield runoff rate. Fine for the effective calculations of modelling that flow. But when you put water into a storage cell underground and allow it to flow out, it becomes foul, it becomes deoxygenated, it collects an awful amount of sediment, which when you have a summer storm, that first pulse of water that comes out from these outfalls is what we call grey water. It's nasty. It's not what we want going into, into our small crystal clear chalk springs. So we need to make sure that we get the best from planning. Now this is the Cambridge area where people want to invest, where people want to be. We should be setting very good standards. Policies do exist. It's whether we can slow down the development, whether we've got more time to negotiate for good quality, and to make sure that we apply all the science and practical knowledge that we know, and we try and only use underwater storage cells when we have to. Much, much better to put an open swale habitat, a shallow pond, where children can perhaps can puddle in some damp mud. They can have a little bit of risk. They can find wildlife. And also, that water is purified as it mixes with the environment and through grass and through soil. That's a better way to do it. That sad log there, that's a flow deflector on a trout fishery on the River Granton, a wild trout fishery, one that we gave an award for back in 2002. But look at the, the colour of the water there, it's brown, because it's been kept flowing by that sewage effluent from Linton Sewage Treatment Works. I'm happy to say the trout were alive there, I thought they might have been lost this summer, but the quality of that water was good enough to keep those trout alive through this summer. So it's this awful situation where our rivers are being kept alive by treated effluent. Is that what we really expect our rivers to be? We've also got siltation of the riverbed. It clogs up all the spaces where the river invertebrates should be living, those small spaces in the stones where bacteria and invertebrates are breaking down nutrients and causing uh, food webs to be initiated. We've also got areas where people don't undertake any tree management. We want some shade on our watercourses, but we don't want great big tunnels of say 100 metres long where nothing is growing underneath them. We have the problem of invasive species. The signal crayfish is burrowing into our riverbanks, causing them to crumble. 
causing my, more fine sediment to be smothering those river gravels. We have Himalayan balsam getting bigger and bigger every year due to nutrient enrichment, fertilizing it in sunlight, causing it to grow to monster scale. We have high water temperatures causing the algal blooms. That's not what you'd expect to see in a chalk stream. It's water ponded up behind a weir in Linton. And we have organisations using herbicide in our water courses, which when we've got very, very low flow situations, that material then degrades, it rots down and degrades the water quality further. Is it appropriate to undertake herbicide control over kilometres of water courses? I'd say perhaps not. Herbicide is a tool to be used wisely and not widely. Back to the granter. This is how it looked on that 6th of September. Not much is going to swim through that. And we knew that was happening. But it's not just fish that die. It's a whole river ecosystem. It's the invertebrates which feed the bats, which feed the birds. The invertebrates which cause the nutrient cycling that break down the leaves. The whole ecosystem is being lost. It's, it's not acceptable in my view. What's most at risk are the things that people don't see. It's those fish and animals that don't have the ability to fly, that don't catch your attention as they swim past, that are small, that live under stones, like bullhead fish. Spined loach that live in the weeds. Stone loach. The white clawed crayfish was still in the can around Eccleton about 10 years ago. Is it still there? We don't know. The brook lamprey. They live in clean mud. And this, Cronoba alpina, that is that rare glacial relic. This is why I don't believe it's natural for our springs to dry up. If our springs naturally dried up, I'm sure that natural occurrence would have happened in the last 10,000 years, that interglacial period, but it hasn't. So that flatworm can still find habitats in glacial springs where there's been that stability, consistency of flow for millennia. And we're losing those clear springs now as we're pumping our chalk aquifer dry. And that flatworm is maybe a really important indicator species. The Hoffer Brook, is it worth restoring it? Here's Ruth scoping up some work with me. You can see a rather AC outfall there, pumping water in. But we, re we restored it, but it slow dropped out. How far can we take its habitat restoration when we're missing that vital ingredient? Spawning areas, shallow, clean gravels, well-sorted gravels, clean and free of fine silt. Trout get together. They quite uh, they, they need a bit of space to thrash around on the shallows. They need to cut into that gravel to make what we call reds, where they lay their eggs. Those eggs then have to sit there for at least 100 days, depending on water temperature. They need stability of flow. They need stability of habitat. They need areas to choose in which to spawn, not just one small patch of gravel, which might be the size of a dustbin lid. If we have repeated low flow years, some of those some of those short-lived species, like the brown trout, don't tend to live much more than five years. If they don't spawn successfully for multiple years, they're lost. But maybe fish species like the chub, which can live for 20 years, minnows live for 10 years, perch 15 or so. Those species, they can play it for the long term. They can pull it through these bad years. But how long will it be before the chub don't find clean gravel in which to spawn? And we'll start to lose those animals from our river systems too. When I was younger, this bridge, the water just flowed off it. It came gushing off. It was not a barrier. Now, by June of most year, it's a step. It's a barrier. Fish don't want to jump. Fish swim. They only jump as a last result. Most fish species could not jump or could not swim up that bridge. So we start to lose areas of rivers. Environmental gauging station, hugely important for knowing what we've got in terms of flowing our rivers. But again, they're representing a barrier to recolonisation of our rivers by some of these species that may have suffered. Invasive species, we typically call this a zola. It's absolutely smothering the surface of the Hopper Brook. And it used to smother the Ree at times because it didn't have enough flow to push it through. It didn't have enough surface movement to cleanse it. It caused deoxygenation and lack of light for those plants that are trying to grow beneath it. That plant could smother the River Cam in Cambridge. We've had floating pennyworts, which thankfully is being controlled, but maybe Azola's coming next. When you've got no flow, people feel the need to constrain rivers, 
top end of the Hopper Brook. Um, not how one would expect a chalk river to look. I didn't expect to be standing here. The Wild Trap Trust is not really a campaigning organisation, but by virtue of the knowledge that I know, the passion I've got for some of these water courses, and the connections that we've got, I'm very, very pleased that I'm here today, able to tell you guys what I know about the state of this area's chalk rivers. And we need to have this dialogue. We need to find out what facts are to be explored further, and what myths are being talked about as well. So what could be done? This is the lower part of the ship, not really much of a water course. It can be reshaped, but should we expect every generation to have a smaller and smaller water course? Reshaped by grading the banks, putting the gravel back in, and making it more resilient to low flow. This was a can this summer. It was going green. It was a pitiful flow over the Jesus Green Lock. There's great strategies about, and maybe we'll get on to talking about some of this, but from reading the Cambridge Water Company drought plan, I have a number of questions. And my first question really is, how come the drought wasn't talked about earlier this summer? That's the great missing part of this dialogue. Thank you. 